right, everybody's good? Everybody can hear me? I kind of talk low sometimes, so if you can't hear me in the back, just tell me to talk up. So hey, my name is Jay Lee Coley. Like she was saying, you gotta, gotta get to know me first because you can call me Jazz, if you're personal. Uh, I'm an anti-trafficking advocate. Uh, I know before you guys had already had a conversation in the class about sex trafficking and something around that, right? Something yeah. like that, yes, remember what? Some sort of presentation. Right, right, right. So the point is, is to kind of reinforce some of the things that they maybe talked about, and then just maybe learn and stack some new information about what you already know. So, but before I get to all that, she was going to talk about my background. So, real quick, I'm from the West Coast, not from Chicago. I uh, grew up in Los Angeles. I was a child actor. It's just kind of what you do when you're out there, you do the entertainment, and it was dope. I did it for a very long time. I did it on seven. So this is some pictures and screenshots from. Mentalist CBS, Girlfriends UPN. Uh, yeah, I play, you know, Bridget? I play yes. Bridge. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, uh, I did that for all the way up to 17. I went to Arts High School in Los Angeles. I was real big into all that for a long time. I did it because I loved it. I did it because I was always trying to get in front of people and talk about something, and I thought acting was the best way to connect. Uh, kind of grew up around the whole United States. My dad was in the military, so we always bounced around. The arts was always something that was stable for me, so I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I saw a diary singer mom. I don't know if y'all know who Robert Townsend is. He's kind of old. He's in our generation. But he's real dope. He had the show. I was allowed to be on it. And it was a great time. And a lot of, of that experience kind of helped shape what and who I am today. So, working from that background, she wanted me to touch on why I transitioned from acting to this. Um, long story short, I was homeschooled because I moved around so much and I kind of, I didn't really have any social skills like at all. I mean, you look at me now and you go, oh, what? No, he must have tons of friends and things to do on the weekend. I don't at all. I never did. So I got up to the <laughs> So I, um, I figured out the best way to connect with people is by helping, right? If you are smiling and you're giving the hugs, things like that, it's a great way to connect and just learn about people. So I started really, really young. Uh, when I was nine years old, I started a non nonprofit called Justice Friends Foundation. Uh, and it was basically just a way for me to connect with other people my age. So kids in hospitals who were bedridden because of diseases and illnesses, uh, children in hospitals, orphanages, homes, like they didn't have toys, access to the outside world the same way that I did. I grew up in so many different diverse communities that I had seen so many different types of pockets of poverty and plight. So I said I wanted to do something that would be in line with what I was, and that's something involving the arts, but also help people. So I took so toys, entertainment, my friends, we did entertainment stuff for the kids, and it was really, really dope. And I did it for like three years, uh, went to 40 different states, went to the Shriners Hospital, and it was incredible, a really great learning experience. But what you learn, though, is the world's a lot bigger than you think in where you're, and the things that you deal with in one community will also happen in another community, but different because those communities are different. The politics, the culture, uh, even the traditions are entirely separate. So you have to know what you're working at. And that's another point of the perspective that really helped in what we're going to talk about later today. So now, today, I'm an anti-trafficking advocate. Why? Because when I was 15, I went to this community organization thing stuff. And there was this lady named Amy. She worked for the UN, the United Nations. She was an anti-trafficking uh, representative for an organization called Girl Up. Have anybody ever heard of Girl Up before? No, it's really, really great. GirlUp.com, I mean, sorry, .org. Great organization. They go to other schools. They go to um, schools and public spaces abroad, so internationally to different communities like India, where child brides and human trafficking is something that's like culture, like casual there. And they try to encourage and educate these young girls to have options other than being sold at like nine years old to some 50 year old. Uh, or having to bear children and have give birth at like 13. So it's really, really amazing work. She told me all about it, kind of blew my mind about what was happening in the world. But I never really touched it until I went to school. So I went to the University of West Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> and it was country. <laughs> so I didn't do anything. But I studied and I learned a lot about human trafficking. I got really, really deep into the research aspect of it and the academic side. I went for political science because I thought, you know, let's see if government can help. And that didn't work. So I decided that I was going to hit the ground and see how just going to communities that we could do these things on our own. So I said I was going to try to do that through getting a master's in public policy. Went to Chicago, Loyola University of Chicago, 
got a master's public policy, and I was able there to work on the research side of it. I'm a big nerd. I like numbers, all that stuff. There's going to be a lot of numbers that we shoot at y'all later. Have fun with no cellular devices to get through that. And it's going to be basically me trying to bounce off what is happening in real life and try to put it into the, the cultures and the kind of things that we see in our everyday. Again, I'm 24. I am technically within your generation. The things that I'm going to be talking about comes from my understanding of what it means. And I just got out of school last May. So I understand how the college environment specifically can be very conducive to issues such as this. Um, so if there isn't any questions, want to hop into it? Yes, sir. Yes? All right, cool. So this is what we're going to be doing today. Uh, gain a greater understanding of the issue of human trafficking. Definitions and statistics. you got to know what it is, how it's happening, how frequently. Um, it kind of helps put validity behind all of this, but at the same time, it's just a great way to understand and relate this information to others. Because the whole point of me being here, hopefully, is to encourage you to know more, so you can encourage others to know more, and then also have a, a pretty better, a better eye in your community, so when you see friends, neighbors, roommates, colleagues go through something like this, you know what it is, you know how to report it, you know how to stop it. Next is uh, victims and vulnerabilities. We're gonna go over how college specifically, like students and young people can protect themselves from trafficking. And then uh, where to go for more information. So how to start getting better at reporting and things like that. So before, I'm gonna start with this very, very boring video. That's gonna be a great overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. And I'm gonna be very professor, uh, profes professor -ish, professor -ish about this for the next like five minutes. So bear with me, but it's actually pretty. What is human trafficking? Be fine. Can see it, right? Human trafficking is modern day slavery. It is the exploitation. For the rest of this, I'm sorry, how much time do we have? Both. We can go to 345. 445. 445. Alright, so I do want this to be a group conversation. Like, I'm not trying to sit up here and just talk at y'all for the next hour. Um, I want to hear your voices. You have questions. I'm very informal. Raise your hand. Let me know. There's going to be spaces for questions too, so if you do have one that's pressing, let me know. But if you can hold on to it, I definitely give you guys time. But I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear what you maybe think about stuff like this. So let's get right into it. There are three major forms of human trafficking, as mentioned in the video, but also seen right here. It's forced labor, sex trafficking, and state funded. And I didn't say that in the video, but I'll talk about that more in a second. But can we say that together, family? Forced <laughs> labor, <laughs> sex trafficking, <laughs> state funded. Child, y'all. Mm. Wow. So true or false, slavery ended in 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation by Lincoln. False. 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 Thank you, man. <laughs> that was false, I would be here. So let's tell why. The first one is that we're going to talk about is uh, how it actually happened. So with the framing of sex trafficking or any sort of human trafficking, the issue is that people don't truly understand what it is, how it functions, and why it's so important that we have a better understanding of what it really is. There's three major forms and definitions that make sex trafficking or human trafficking what exactly it is, what exactly it is, and it defines by an action, a means, and a purpose. So for an action, we're talking about how people actually recruit, actually get people and people who are vulnerable in tough spaces to consider um, making certain decisions for themselves. And this happens through, you know, providing, harboring, recruiting, seducing, transporting. Uh, but those technically are just words to say that they're trying to get to know you, they're trying to lure you, they're trying to understand what your patterns are, what your routines are, who you are, what your interests are, um, so they can use that as leverage. And they're gonna do that to uh, eventually get you to either patronize or solicit sex, and then the means. So the means is actually like the forced part, like how they're actually gonna force you, and manipulate you into these situations. We define it through, legally, through force, fraud, and coercion. Does anyone have any idea of what force, fraud, and coercion can be getting at, and what that can be concerned? There's no bad answer, you don't have to raise your hand. Where it's a force, you like, you know, just kidnapping and then fraud, would that be um like lying on them, like blackmail? Yeah. And then exactly. coercion would be like you said, selling love or whatever. Like, exactly. And that's you know, like telling what they want to hear. And then, Textbook manipulation. And honestly, sometimes it's just as simple as just abuse, yeah. uh, rape, uh, physical abuse, but also it can get really complicated, such as talking about coercion. Love, manipulation, tricking someone psychologically to thinking that this is their decision yeah. and not yours. And then the last one is purpose. So why they're going through all this trouble in the first place? What is the end goal? The end goal is typically always going to be for involuntary servitude. They're trying to make a profit off of you, off of your body, off of your labor. And typically they can do this through like sexual exploitation, 
Uh, there's been a lot of cases where a woman has had a sexual encounter with a man, he filmed it, she didn't know, and then he extorted her through that, blackmailed her into doing something that she never thought she would do. Pretty much as we know it today, it's modern slavery, like the video said. It's pretty much the evolution of what we saw back in textbook days. Um, and we can talk more about that in a second. But for quick reminder, what we're thinking, everything we're talking about today is real. The things that we're trying to chip at is something that happens so visibly, but also invisibly, that it's hard for us to kind of disturb, to try to distort uh, what is exploitation in itself. Um, and there's a big conversation that we're now having as a society, especially on college campuses, about how people with very, very little are getting scammed and profited off by people who have a lot, um, and how that sort of uh, oppression is being per perpetrated through lack of education, lack of knowledge, and that's why things like today is really important to equip people and to encourage, encourage other people to empower themselves through education. So the main three, we'll get this real quick. Uh, sex trafficking, the simple truth of that, like I said, it's real. Uh, black girls and runaways have the highest risk, so black women. Fortunately, when it comes to a situation like this, not only do you sell higher, but they are trying to find and recruit and abduct you faster than they would abduct other populations because there is unfortunately a, less, a higher likelihood of no one's going to look for you. Law enforcement is less likely to um, have urgency in finding you if a missing report case is filed. And when it comes to how, as society has deemed black girls, typically they're labeled as fast or already dangerous to begin with, so when situations like this occur, you're working through so many stereotypes that it's hard for society to really catch up with the urgency of your situation. So with that, everyone in the room who isn't a black woman, that means we have to watch black women. That means we have to protect black women. That means we have to look out and make sure that when other people are looking at them or treating them badly, we have to step in that space and make sure that we are standing up for them. And it's not just black women. Of course, it's also other uh, races and colors as well. But when we're talking about who's at risk, when we're talking about who's most vulnerable, there is um, a statistical and literal difference. The next one is uh, victims, when it comes to this, uh, you typically find sex trafficking victims forced into lives of prostitution, um, working in massage parlors, um, working in some sort of form of sex work, or maybe even uh, in pornography, exotic dancing. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. And then I call this the T. T is like the truth that we don't want to talk about, but it's still the truth. Uh, basically, it doesn't only happen to girls, men. Raise your hand if you're a man, or identifies as a girl. So when it comes to us, we are incredibly underreported, incredibly under uh, suspected to be victims of such like this. Just like in the same way a lot of people don't believe that men can be raped, and the same way that a lot of people don't believe that men can be sexually assaulted. The truth is, we can, and it does happen, either by other men or by women. In cases like this, since we have so much stigma, men don't get reported, and because of that we have terrible statistics that show that this is happening not only to men, so it's affecting our resources, and also people who actually need to get help. Um, especially talking towards like LGBTQ culture um, and communities. The last one is, uh, the last two is, you don't have to be kidnapped, and that whole, uh, that would never happen to me spirit is dangerous. Uh, you don't have to be kidnapped. Trafficking does have a, expect, uh, has a component of transport to it, but you don't necessarily have to be uh, taken from your house. There's been a lot of cases where people have been trafficked from their own apartments, from their own homes, by their own parents, by their own uncles, um, to their own street and to the members of their own community. It doesn't have to necessarily happen somewhere foreign, and then you're taken from that space to another. And then that, never, that would never happen to me. It's dangerous. You can't do that. <laughs> Uh, at the end of the day, you don't have to always believe that you are at risk, but at the same time, if you never believe something's going to happen to you, you're never on the radar of making sure that you're protected from it. The same way that we have to worry about the health and the things that we take to our body, things in our environment and who we surround ourselves with is just as important. As I get this face. Forced labor. So everybody should know by this point, forced labor gets towards what we're talking about back in the day of slavery channel slavery, uh, it's pretty much the evolution of what we find today. It's the most popular form of human trafficking. And, okay. and uh, what we see today when it comes to trafficking is typically around the forms of nanny, domestic servitude, people working in factories, people working in construction sites, people working in restaurants and not being paid. Uh, a lot of cases, when we go to those restaurants around the community where it's like mostly Hispanic, uh, it's a Mexican joint, so most of the 
uh, the staff is Hispanic, or we go to a Chinese restaurant and most of the staff is Chinese. Those are cases where we have to be a little more considerate about what exactly may be happening in there. They could have been from a foreign born country, brought here, now working under the radar, but not necessarily getting paid adequate wages. That's the form of trafficking. It's less reported because it seems to be less severe than sex trafficking, but it's still an issue. It all feeds back to the same space. Uh, and then the T is for this one, is where are they? We don't see them, so this must not be true. That's false as well. We actually see them much more prevalently. Um, when you see children uh, panhandling or selling bottles on the side of the road, sometimes people suspect that to be trafficking, but it's actually not so much the case. More of the case is things when you're seeing uh, young girls being forced to sell certain products uh, online or forced to do certain things surrounding sexuality but not, exa not exactly a sex act, uh, they're being probably forced or coerced by someone they know to do certain things like that. But obviously they won't disclose. And then the last fact is there are more slaves today than there ever was in all history. And that's just a fact. We have way more better understanding of how slavery actually survives in societies now, but we don't have any way of, we don't really have an understanding of how to really stop it. So what that means is that we've seen that we are having an epidemic that's causing uh, more and more people to become exploited, but we don't know how to stop it. So it's just growing, that number is growing. And the last one, and this is the part that actually pisses me off the most, state funded, you won't hear about this a lot, it's a whole conspiracy. You can believe it, but it's literally true. Slavery exists legally in the US prison system. Everybody remembers the, the Great War on Drugs that happened back in the 80s, right? Yeah. And that whole thing that we're going to round up all the crackheads and put them away. Yeah. Well, that never stopped, and all those crackheads were actually just non-offending uh, non -offending and non-violent black people. Uh, so there's specifically black men who now make up like 90% of the US population when it comes to prison labor. Unfortunately, well, secretly and unfortunately, there's this thing that came out of nowhere that no one seemed to know about called Unicor, which popped up overnight and allowed factories uh, to go into privately owned pr uh, prisons, and pretty much every prison in the United States is privately owned. Yeah. They built these factories in the prisons, and guess who the prison worker, the factory workers are? The inmates. That's and they get paid literally pennies. the pennies, bro. Like, literally less than a dollar, less than a dollar nationally, but the average is actually 18 cents an hour. Yep. Can't do anything with that. Um, and they work all the time. So, like, I have people. That's actually the one. Yeah, they explained this to me. I heard it was illegal now to do that. No. Like, no, they said, like, Victoria's Secret had a case or something like that. You heard about that? There is, so, typically when it comes to the, the, the function itself, like, the, the actual law is not illegal. They can make you work. Uh, according to the Emancipation Proclamation, if you're convicted as a felon or some sort of uh, criminal. I'm talking company-wise. No, company-wise, company. it depends on the company that's in the prison, right? Not any company can come to the prison instead of a factory, but things like license plates. Um, yeah, the license plates. Military licensing. uniforms. Yeah, even like classroom tests <coughs> and stuff panties. like that. They make panties, too. Panties. Um, so it's something that we have to be a little more upset about because it's happening prevalently, and that's why when we do have conversations about, like, let's legalize weed, yay, but are we also going to let out all the people who got in for weed, you know, like, no. Because they're losing money. These people are not, yeah. they're money. All exactly. Business. So, to keep it simple, to wrap it all up, human trafficking is basically when someone makes you work for them, but you don't get paid. Makes you have sex for money, but you don't get paid. Tricks you into selling something, but you don't get paid. Forces you to clean our nanny, but you don't get paid. And makes you work tirelessly, but you don't get paid. Do you see the common thing? Um, I had a friend, she actually was, she told me that she was in love with this girl, but she was like probably around like 26 and she was like 20. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, they, they were together for like about a year or so and she also lived in a home which was very like, conservative to the point where it's like family didn't like really accept homosexual relationships or stuff like that. Right. Um, and a lot of like the warning signs kind of like, like there was no like branding or like any physical like signs of abuse or anything or like always hire a slave class. class. Um, but like all the other ones, they kind of like alarmed me because I don't know if this was actually what she could have went through yeah. before her parents stepped in and stopped it all. But from meeting this woman, she didn't really see
seem like she wasn't using her at all. They seem happy together. Mm -hmm. So even law decides to kind of like maybe perk up and go, okay, well, I've seen a lot of that kind of stuff. Right. So, well, I mean, I this is know. not a, a what's the word? it's not a super conclusive list, but this can overlap with a lot of other issues. Um, just just generally child sex abuse uh, or just abuse uh, generally when there's been trauma, like really, really bad trauma, uh, physical, verbal, mental abuse in the home. This could also be some of the great ways. It's just a way of peeking in into what may be going on with them and then you have to start kind of letting them tell their story so you can see if it's a trafficking case, a sexual abuse case, something like that. Um, but I would say just a piece of the age difference and there is always a dynamic of control there, no matter if they want to feud or not. Um, for older, you know more, you can play off of more. When you're younger, you look more naive, so you're more uh, easy to be taken advantage of stuff like that. Uh, I was just thinking about the uh, first one. Yeah. And uh, obviously, like, as a guy, like, coming from Atlanta, you see, like, there's a lot of people. Yeah, you see some of that one. Like, a lot of women look good. And so, basically, during my homeboy, we went to, uh, we went to Vegas in, like, April. And so, but there, we didn't really think too much of it. It's like, okay, you see that woman everywhere. And I was like, come on. It was like, because I'm not used to it, like, when I was there. And I was like, ain't no way you can pull that. And <laughs> like you said, like, the first one, it was like this old right. white guy. But that's like your sixth sense. Yeah. Like, that doesn't seem and, right. Um, surprisingly, it was like, there's this one girl. And, you know, they, they, they got common, 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 common conversation with you. Yeah. Like, just, you know, creating, like, a relationship. Just kind of, you know, what you and so I'm the one from Atlanta. Yeah. And I'm not gonna lie, I was with And I was just sitting there and I was just like, look, I'm in the I'm in the hotel. Like uh, every hotel has a casino. Yeah. So, uh, our homeboy showed us around. I'm like looking like trying to figure it out, I'm not even lit. And then what? like this one girl walked by and I'm like, where are you from? And she's like, I'm from Atlanta. And we get in a conversation. And I was like, if you don't mind me asking, because obviously I don't care at this point. I'm like, how did you get into this? And then she was like, to be honest with you, she was like, you don't really know, so you just go. Like, yeah. she was like, I'm from Atlanta and I'm here. Like, yeah. wow. I knew coming out here is gonna be more expensive, different stuff like that. Right. And it's like, you kind of know one person, that one person is used to somebody. Exactly. And you think it's your friend. Yeah. And then you just you just go, you don't even notice it. And then obviously, she, it's, not, it's like, it didn't get extra deep, but just like in terms of how it was, I was just like, you know, in your mind, you think like, how could you get to that point in life? But. It's like you think about like when you're broke, broke. It's like you try to do. Anything. You're broke, bro. You like that, bro, 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 yeah. bro, bro. Everything sounds like a good idea. But it was, it was definitely. And that's like, where yeah, your defenses yeah. are down, stuff like that. All right, one what, what question, and then I gotta get to the rest of this. I'm sorry, y'all. Not really a question. Was so working off of what he said? It's with a short. The older, yeah, yeah. Okay. I work at a bar in Buckhead, and there's like a bunch of like the older guys with younger, younger women. Yes, gross, right? And like I didn't really think about it, <laughs> and it makes a, lot of, <laughs> makes a lot of sense that it like you know. It could be yeah. that or they're, you know, like prostitutes. And they recruit. Once he gets to this point, it's almost too late. That's when they try to get you alone. They try to get you to meet them somewhere. They try to get you at a party or try to get you to take them somewhere. Uh, and then they try to exploit. Once they have you in their possession, they will do whatever it takes at that point to force you to do this. Because at that point, they only care about the money. They don't care about you or the people that they're trying to force. Um, if they know, they'll do anything to make you change your mind. Uh, why is it happening? So people always ask, why is this happening? Why is it? I would say generally because people, when getting when in spaces where they have no more empathy for others, they see money only as their objective, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. They're willing to look at other people as property or commodities, and they'll do whatever it takes in order to keep that money coming in. Um, the online sex trade market is booming, has always been booming ever since we got the internet. Pedophiles, uh, in my, I did a quick Google the other day, in my own area, I'm from Stockbridge, Georgia. Uh, just there, there's 801 pedophiles with less than like 20 miles of me. 801. Registered publicly. So where are the pedophiles, if they are still trying to commit their crime, where are they going to get their children? Not from the street, because that's how they got caught the first time. They're gonna go into these spaces where they know they can do it privately and discreetly, book a hotel room, get in and out, and not get back in trouble. But that means that that's the demand, right? We know we all know about market, right? Supply and demand. So if there's a demand, that means there has to be a supply. That means they have someone has to go get those children and sell them to meet that demand. So that's what I'm talking about when it comes to the online sex trade market. 
It's incredibly easy. You can find uh, victims online. It's not rocket science. Anyone can do it, and that's the issue. Uh, high demand of CSEC, like you said, Atlanta is a hub for child sex trafficking. Since there's such a large demand here, there's a large supply. Pornography, people are always trying to force people into pornography. It's a business, it makes a lot of money. You won't, but they will. And because of that, they're going to keep trying to find people who are uh, insecure enough, people who are poor enough, and people who are vulnerable enough to consider this. And all they have, all they have to do is get you once, but then they most likely get you again. And then the last one, you barely see it because it likes it bad, but we don't talk about it. This is something that we don't really have major discussions about as a community, as a discussion. It's been happening in broad daylight, but we've just been living our lives. So we have to correct that. We have to be more aware, especially in the black community, most vulnerable, most likely. Um, when it comes to communities of color, specifically, terrible statistics when it comes to likelihood of being saved. Uh, Populations that are more wealthy have a higher, higher likelihood and since Caucasian populations have had the most money. Generally, as a, as a nation, generationally, there's been more likelihood of them being rescued and actually given services once found. Also, they can afford certain attorney services at a higher likelihood. Traffickers can be men, women, strangers in your DMs, new friends, online job, modeling scams, uh, older peers, men trying to talk to you, pretty much everything. There's no particular pro uh, profile. Victims can be people who look like you, people who look like your friends, people who look like people your age, those who are younger. Um, buyers are, I call them whole husbands or whole fathers because that's what they are. They're people with entire families, but they're still doing this and perpetrating this uh, issue because, like you said, overabundance of money, power, complexes, all that stuff. Porn addicts, sugar mama, sugar daddies. Okay, legit, listen, if someone's willing to pay a child to be with them, what is that like? And they're an adult, that's a pedophile. It's literally a pedophile, but the whole sugar mom, sugar daddy thing has put like a really weird gloss on all that. So we have to be better at making that connection. Uh, and then women, women can especially be traffickers. They are number one in recruiting other women into the situation and can also be the madams or the ladies of the brothels that we see in broad daylight. Um, and then the reality is, Lana's top of list for C6, like I said, and less than 2% of trafficking victims are ever found. And that's not made up. We get less than 2%. Once we lose them, don't get them back. Especially, and if we do, they're dead. So that's why you have to stay in the space where you're right now not being trafficked. Like law enforcement will most likely not find you. So uh, what makes you at risk specifically? Um, again, we talked about this a little bit, but just to really nail it in. Uh, black children are most likely, black females especially, males are least likely to be identified as safe. Past views, if they've already been through something like this, they're more, more likely to go through it again. Uh, money, if you're poor, you have to pay for things yourself, you're more likely. Uh, health, uh, mental health, so those who are disabled or have disabilities, they're a little easier to convince and manipulate. So we have to be more protective for those populations. Identity, those who have to deal with uh, constant sexism, discrimination, uh, homophobia, transphobia, they're most likely to be put into a space of having very limited options. So that's when situations like this become prevalent. And then culture, so for people of color, um, what happens in the house stays in the house, is a really big thing that is passed out generation to generation, and we have to stop, <coughs> we have to quit that. It's really, really damaging. When we have situations where people are, young girls are being molested and sexually assaulted in their own homes, but we're saying what happens in the house stays in the house, who are they supposed to? tell, how are they going to get help? There's been so many cases where mothers have trafficked their own daughters. And trafficked again, it's just selling someone for money. So there's been mothers who sold their daughters to a boyfriend. Out, stop requiring the old heads and block every suspicious person. That is going to be your best friend, especially as you get older. Please block everybody. If they make you mad, if they make you feel uncomfortable, things like that. If they're trying to holler at you, but they're inappropriate, let them go. You don't have to entertain them, anything like that. And then for um, people who are working in very conservative backgrounds, like your family's are very traditional in certain ways, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. But I would say when it comes to issues like this, become a traitor to your culture. That whole whatever happens in the house stays in the house thing can get a lot of people in trouble, um, especially yourself. So if you do get in a situation where you have to speak out, please do. It's OK to go against some of the wishes. If you're talking about your family business, 
your own mental health, your own personal safety, your own is way more important than any of their ideals of what the house should be looking like, okay? Please protect yourself. It's not snitching, it's called protecting yourself. Uh, Lyft and Uber, so for me personally, in Chicago, I was constantly taking Ubers, and I was constantly going places by myself, but I always had like three friends who always had my location all the time, and especially about riding alone, I would text them my ETA and all that stuff. Uh, for girls, there have been a lot of cases that we've seen on Instagram where people have been kidnapped through Ubers um, because they'll get yeah, a child lock. Right, they just got caught. Like, black, white, they were all working together yeah. in Uber. Mm -hmm. They're picking you up, they're having the child lock on, so please check that. It's right in the side of the door when you get in. Because uh, if you need to make a quick escape, you want to have the tools you have to get. And if you can't do it that way, kill them. Like, protect yourself, do whatever it takes. Kill <laughs> and get out the car and run to safety. Uh, but also ask these questions like what's my name, double check the plate lights, uh, plate, car plate, driver, uh, make sure that the driver follows the locations, no shortcuts, even if there's a reroute, make sure he's following the actual GPS. Um, don't ride in the front seat, one is awkward and weird, it's just don't, it's a car, it's like a car pool, I guess, but like still like don't. Uh, and then trust your gut, the person seems weird, hop out, call another one. And then last one, always be really to rescue. The issue with Eli uh, Kaniah Blanchard and Alexis Crawford is that immediately when they went missing, uh, their kidnappers, especially for Anaya, he disabled all her apps, like all the locations. So when the police was looking for her, when the investigators at the FBI was trying to see where her location was, they could not find her anywhere. And we have so much technology these days that it's actually really fortunate that we have things like Find My Friends and with that because we need a quick ping about where someone is. We can get into that way, and they can also get into like Twitter updates, Instagram, all that stuff tracks your information in a really creepy world these days. But that all can hopefully uh, be something that allows law enforcement to find you if someone that you know or yourself go missing one day. Uh, so I would say enable the um, the location, the share location on most of the Weaver apps. So things that you would necessarily expect has GPS, like all your health apps, like running and tracking, it, like they all track you. Have those on, keep those on. That can be a really easy way for someone to find you if something goes wrong. So two things with the Uber. Would it be best to like get in on like the driver's side, you know what I'm saying? Like instead of sit like over here? I mean, yeah, I would say try to always have the advantage. So if because the thing about Uber is like you're willingly getting in the car, right? You've called them to come get you. Yeah. Uh, then you have your location at all times. So if that's the case, if you suspect something weird is happening, you're probably not going to know until after you get in the car, after you probably close the door and you're asking those questions. Before you get in the car, though, you should definitely knock on the window and be like, hey, what's your name? What's my name? All that stuff uh, before you get into the car. But once you're in and things still don't seem right, that's when I would say maybe transfer into yourself if you have space to get in behind him. And then if you have to bail, Wait for a stoplight, stop sign.